Welcome, everybody, back to The Rooted and Edified Show. We're so glad that you're joining us today. You're in for a special episode, Opening the Scriptures. I'm your host, Caddy Elias, and we have your co-host slash guest of honor today. And we are very blessed to have Manny Elias here. Happy dance for you. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Before we introduce Manny Elias even more, though you probably know of him from the other episodes and from being a co-host on this show, I want to remind you of a few things about this podcast. This podcast is part of Beautifully Rooted, which is a Christian mental health and education corporation. And this show, The Rooted and Edified Show, is a fun-loving, no-facade, conservative Christian worldview show for both men and women who want to hear real-life testimonies, topics that are interesting and pertinent, talents within the church, and also theology, of course. So those are the four T's. We want to help you mature in your walk and deepen your relationship with Christ. If you want to know more about our podcast or you just have decided, I really want to support what you're doing, feel free to check us out on our website, which is www.beautifullyrooted.com, which is spelled B-E-Y-O-U. Just as a reminder, Manny Elias is my husband. Happy for that. Oh, me too. He is a father of six. He studied missiology and was a missionary in Mexico where he planted a church. He is Beautifully Rooted's chief biblical consultant, and he's a co-host of this show, of course. He has some other episodes for you to check out, which includes his personal testimony, which is from darkness to light, and also Bible 101. So Bible 101 can be a little bit of a precursor to this episode. Yes, it is. It's describing what is the Bible, where does it come from, what does it consist of, and why is it so important to read. In his spare time, aside from all those things I just listed, he also works with loans and mortgages. So Mr. Elias, would you mind telling us a little bit more about yourself? Absolutely. Well, it's an honor and a privilege to be here again. I love both being a a co-host and a guest. And a husband. And a husband. One of the things that I definitely value is what we're doing here with the podcast, what our goal is, is that we want to be a podcast for the master. We want to make sure that the master's message is delivered. We want to make sure that the master's name is known and that the master's word is read. Amen. Yes, as you mentioned, and I think I had I mentioned it briefly before in the previous podcast. I did study missiology and doing missionary work. A lot of people sometimes when they would ask me about how I learned so much about the Bible, they assume that it had been in my missiology school. But in all honesty, I did learn theology from a missionary perspective. That's what missiology is, the study of missions. But the actual theology that I learned most of it was on my own personal time and devotion to the Word of God. And more than anything, more than reading of books, it was reading the book. That's a great segue for us to jump into getting started with discussing opening up the scriptures. When you refer to opening up the scriptures, is that a biblical phrase? Is that found in the Bible? Where do we find that if it is? And what exactly do you mean by that? Well, first off, yes, it is found in scripture. We're actually going to read that scripture in a a bit. Um, It's found in Luke chapter 24. It's a beautiful phrase that means more than just literally opening the Bible. And by the way, as I was discussing with one of our pastors at our church the other day, and I told him, you know what, I want to do a segment like that, you know, like opening the scriptures. I love that phrase, opening the scriptures and what it represents. But he did tell me something, and I think he was joking, but at the same time, it, it is true. Opening the scriptures literally means physically opening the Bible as well. In order for the Lord Jesus to open the scriptures to you, that means to open your mind to the Word of God, to unlock things in the Word of God that sometimes people don't understand not necessarily because they're complex or philosophically or theologically deep, but because they have a veil covering their eyes and they're blinded to the truth of the Bible. And that's why a lot of people can read the Bible, but the Bible is still close to them, spiritually close to them. So opening the scriptures means that God opens your mind and reveals his message in the word of God to you in the Bible. The Bible is the living word of God. But there's something there that has to be unlocked so that that living word of God could then be opened and made clear to you. And the only way that happens is when the Lord Jesus opens the scriptures to you, as we will read in a bit. Thank you. I'm looking forward to that. Why is it so important to have the scriptures open to you? And how do we know when it happens? Really good questions, both. I think first off, it's important because since it is the living word of God and it is the means by which God communicates with us. In old times, the scripture says in the book of Hebrews, in the old days, God would reveal himself to us through prophets. Oftentimes, 
when God revealed himself to the people, a lot of the people didn't have the Bible in a book format the way we do now. They would have to go hear the word of God. That's why a lot of times it says hear the word of God. It's not like everybody could go and access it and say, let me turn to the book of Acts. There was no biblical codex yet. It hadn't been put into books. There was no chapters. There were no verses. Imagine if they saw us now with the Bibles that we have on our phones where we could just push something in and say, are you serious? That is amazing. To be honest with you, I think they'd be envious. Absolutely. I think they'd be envious, you know, and I think at the same time, we'd probably be envious of their love and their zeal for the Word of God. Absolutely. And how much they did to have to access the Word of God. But anyhow, it's important also because that is the main way that God now communicates with us. He no longer uses prophets like in the Old Testament days. And we'll touch on that subject in a bit when we talk about sensationalism. But one of the things is a lot of people sometimes hear that particular phrase, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord. And a lot of so-called self-proclaimed prophets will use that phrase to imply that what they're about to say comes directly from the Holy Spirit. But no man can claim that authority now. That authority is only given to the Word of God. So when we say, thus says the Lord, you better be quoting scripture. You know, not just your heart or your mind or something you thought you heard, but you better be quoting scripture. And even if God did give that particular gift to someone, it still have to be based, whatever they said, on scripture. And scripture has become the ultimate authority in the church. It's important to know it because without knowing the authority for truth in the church, how will you then know truth, period? And not only that, but one of the most important reasons why is because we're commanded to. We're commanded to, as we did in that last segment, we mentioned Joshua 1, 9, that everybody loves to quote, but they don't love the preceding verse, which is, this book of the law shall never depart from you, right? But you will meditate on it day and night. He commands us to learn his word and to get into his word. And that last episode that you're talking about is Bible 101. Yes, correct. How do we effectively study the Bible and gain insight and knowledge of the word? I think one of the most important things that we definitely need to keep in mind as we're about to read the Bible is the posture that our heart has. I mean, if you humble yourself before God and you say, Lord, I really need you to speak to me. Right now I'm going through something and I need to hear you in my life. I need to hear your word. God has promised that if we seek him with all our heart, we will find him. And one of the best ways to find God is not necessarily running to a certain location, but running to the word of God. You have the Word of God. Whether you're parked in a parking lot, whether you're at home, whether you're in the kitchen, wherever you are, and you open up your your Word of God, your Bible, and you say, you know what, Lord, I just really want you to speak to me. God has promised that He will. And if you have that attitude, I guarantee you, you're going to hear the Lord's voice in the Word of God. Not audibly, but you will hear it in the Word of God, in your heart and in your spirit. Unless you have an audio Bible. There you go. Then you'll hear Jim Caviezel's um, voice as Jesus What are some important things that we should keep in mind as we're trying to learn and digest scripture? I think one of the important things to definitely remember as you begin your journey reading the Bible, and I think there's definitely different levels of where every disciple is in their journey of studying scripture. And one of the desires that you have to have, and I think we mentioned this in our last podcast, Bible 101, is not that you want to master the word of God, that you want to master the Bible rather that you want the Bible to master you, that you want the Word of God to master your thoughts, your heart, your desires, your emotions, your imagination, your thought life, and your body. And when you have that desire, when you ask God for that, I think God will prepare your heart and your mind to learn the Word of God. And that's what opening the Scriptures means. He's preparing your mind and your heart to suddenly, after that reading, you're going to say, I understand this now. And it's something that happens gradually. I wish I could tell you that it happened the first time you read the Bible through. I probably won't. It probably didn't start happening with me. I started calling it like connecting the dots. I started really connecting the dots in different scriptures, probably on my second or third turn of the Bible, to be honest with you. And I began to familiarize myself with the characters in the Bible, different topics of the Bible. And I began to identify with them it creates this lasting appeal. If Harry Potter could do it, if other books could do it, if romantic novels could do it for girls, you know, or whatever it is that you're reading, guys read DC comics, Marvel comic books. If all these things can 
captivate your imagination and capture your attention and have a, a even a temporary appeal on you, how much more do you think the Word of God will? It will. Suddenly it's going to start occupying more of your mind, more of your thought life. One of the important things I think that we want to address, my question to you would be, do you need to be highly educated to have the scriptures open to you, to understand it? Do you need to have a degree in it? No, not at all. Yeah, one of the things that I think is of utmost importance and that I believe all Christians should definitely know is that when the first disciples were learning the Bible, they didn't necessarily have an academic or systematic approach to learning the Bible. What they had was Jesus. And it's amazing because they had the Old Testament. But when Jesus came along, the Old Testament came to life to them. Suddenly there were things that they probably had read before in the Old Testament that now they're like, wow, now I really know exactly what this means because Jesus was now their teacher. And see, that's one of the things that I strongly believe. The Lord Jesus is still our teacher. And sometimes we forget that. And we look to academia, we look to having a certain degree to be able to be considered qualified to be not just a student of the Bible, but to be a teacher of the Bible. And if you look at that, besides maybe the Apostle Paul, none of them were educated at the feet of Gamaliel, like the Apostle Paul. That was his teacher in the book of Acts. But they were educated at the feet of Jesus. And I think that's something that we are all offered. It reminds me of the time that I shared with you my testimony where I really wanted to learn more about the Bible when I became a Christian. And I remember one day seeking actually different brothers in the church, older older brothers in the church, elders, asking them, hey, would you please take me under your wing and teach me the Bible? I felt like Timothy that needed a Paul. And God bless my godmother, Elizabeth Rubio, who, who was such a blessing and taught me so much about the Bible when I first converted. I remember one day crying in the living room and saying, Lord, I don't have a Paul in my life. I don't have someone to teach me your word, to guide me and to teach me your word. I'm reading all these things, but I don't have a teacher. And I desired at that time, you know, man, I'd love to go to Fuller Seminary. I'd love to go to a Bible college. And I remember crying in my living room and asking the Lord sincerely, sincerely with all my heart, man, Lord, how I wish I had someone to teach me your word the way Paul taught Timothy. And I remember suddenly having so much peace in my heart, and I'm not going to say that I heard it audibly, but I heard the Lord's voice through the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, in, our, in my heart and in my thoughts, in my mind. And the Lord answered me and said, you do have a teacher. And I'm like, whoa, who is it going to be, Lord? Is it going to be this brother or another brother? And I threw out a couple names, and I remember the Lord answering me in my heart and saying, you have the apostles to teach you. Learn from Paul. Learn from Peter. Learn from John. Learn from Matthew. And I'm like, oh, wow, okay. And I remember having read in Luke chapter 16, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, where at one point Lazarus tells Abraham, please, Father Abraham, send someone from here, send Lazarus, but send someone from here to go and tell my brothers, talk to them about this place, talk to them about the truth so that they won't come here. And I remember Abraham answering the rich man and saying, even if somebody were to rise from the dead, they would not believe that person. Obviously implying that even Jesus, they would not believe if he appeared to suddenly the Pharisees. But then he says the following, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. It reminds me of the passage in Mark 12, 24, where Jesus says to the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living, in reference to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even though Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were dead. So in some way, because the Word of God is a living Word of God, it's as if the Apostle Paul is teaching you now. So when you read that Word, even though it was communicated and even written by Paul, it was inspired by God. That's why we strongly believe that the Bible, even though it's written by humans, it's divine in origin rather than human in origin, meaning it originates from God's heart. When you read the epistles of the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter, when you read the different epistles or the first of John, that's the apostles themselves teaching you. And I remember when the Lord said this to me, I cried. And guess what I began to do? Delve into it more. I began to read it and read it and read it and read it every day, but now with the expectation that he's going to teach me. And I think something we should mention that you mention quite often is that some of the people that you know that know scripture the best, don't have a degree, don't always even speak English, right? Because I think sometimes we forget that you don't have to speak English in order to understand the Bible. You need to understand the Bible in general. That's a very, very good point. 
it reminds me of the phrase that the elders at the first church that I went to um, used to use when they would talk in reference to the Bible. They'd ask in Spanish, donde estas, which means, where are you? What they meant was something spiritual. Where are you in your walk with the Lord? And what they meant by that is, where are you in scripture? And I remember I began to overhear them speak to each other that way and say, hey, brother Jesse, where are you? And he goes, well, I'm in Jeremiah. And brother Eliseo, Elisha, where are you? Well, I'm in Chronicles. I'm in Second Chronicles. And then they'd say, well, you know what? Manny is also in the book of Kings or, or he's in Chronicles. Why don't you go, guys go out to grab dinner and talk about the scripture? And I remember we'd begin to just talk about the scripture. The thing is, guys, that these men, the majority of them were from very small, remote villages in El Salvador. They weren't all the most educated academically, but man, were they educated in the word of God. These men were able to quote scripture to you like no one else I've ever met. Even if you quoted a scripture and I said, I can't remember where this particular scripture is, but I, I would quote a scripture. Oh, this is in Second Kings, you know, chapter four or verse something. And I'm like, wow. And to be honest with you, this is the irony. And obviously I have some friends who are theologians and, and I definitely appreciate them and I love them in Christ. And you respect degrees. And I respect them. Absolutely. And absolutely. Absolutely. That takes a lot of diligence as well. But the biggest irony that was that we used to have a preacher that used to come to that particular church who everybody was very fond of because he had several doctorates and he was a professor at a prestigious Christian university. And I remember once where a certain particular subject came up, he was questioning whether Adam was the first man created by God or not, or whether Adam had evolved. And obviously, if I asked the brothers that supposedly weren't educated, right, the brothers that didn't have an academic degree, they'd tell you right off the bat, hey, Adam is the first man created, because that's what the book of 1 Corinthians says in chapter 15. And yet this man was over here discussing, you know, the possibility of maybe Adam having been an evolved being, you know, that God created him like a Neanderthal or what have you, and then later on he progressively became a, a man as we know now. And I simply asked the teacher, the preacher, he was a preacher as well, what about 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Paul clearly states, and the first man created is Adam, created from the dust, he says. He doesn't mention anything about Adam evolving. He literally looked dumbfounded and said, you know what? Shoot, you're right. And I'm like, so what does that do with all your theological supposition or speculation? And it's just one of those things that I thought at that moment, how someone that didn't have a degree, but had read that scripture so many times, knew that scripture. And yet this theologian who had studied several books on theology, systematic theology, how could he not know that scripture? And I remember that's the first time that I saw that contrast. And I began to think differently about these men, even though they were not the most academically educated and didn't have degrees. But man, they had a love and a respect and a knowledge of the Word of God. And when I say the Word of God, it's that same Word of God that's open to all of us right here, the Bible. I'm not talking about a certain theologian's book on systematic theology. I'm talking about the Word of God. So certainly we're not saying don't pursue a degree Absolutely, in theology. Man. Correct, correct. That's an admirable goal that will deepen your study in many ways, likely. What we want to point out and to highlight is that you don't have to do that in order to understand the Word of God or to read the Word of God. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to speak in a particular language. You don't have to have a particular working status or a particular socioeconomic status. You don't have to have any of those things. What you need is the Bible. And we know people who have learning disabilities that would normally prevent them from reading easily, and they still have a grasp of the scriptures. They still read scripture, and I'm imagining daily. Now, let's discuss what are some barriers that there might be to understanding God's word? What could potentially get in the way of us growing and really understanding God's word, if there's uh, anything? First, I'd say for sure you want to read a translation of the Bible, a version of the Bible that is in your language. So if your primary language is Spanish, read in Spanish. Don't feel that you're obligated to read it in English. Also, I think one of the sometimes traditions in a lot of the churches that, for example, are like King James only church, which is equivalent to the Spanish church that is Reina Valera only. To be honest with you, that's the way I, I read the scripture. I read the old King James version in English, and I read the old Reina Valera version in Spanish. And I remember the first time I read it, I was like, I don't even speak this English. It's like an intro to Shakespeare. And in Spanish, much less. I'm like, wait a minute. My mom doesn't say this in Spanish this way. You know, she doesn't speak Spanish this way. I remember I started reading the ESV version 
then in in Spanish, there was an updated Reina Valera version, 1960, that was so much easier to understand because it used Spanish I was familiar with and it used English I was familiar with. So that's that's very important. I think you want to read the Bible in a way that you will understand it. And if that means you've been reading the NIV version or whatever version it is, read it in that version. The important thing is that you're understanding what you're reading. And it's something where you think, hey, you know what? This particular subject or this particular passage I didn't understand. Don't beat yourself up over it. I think it's something that gradually you become familiar with. You reread it again. And then you begin to read other passages in Scripture that somehow clear that passage up or correlate. And one of the great hermeneutical rules that I learned and this is actually from one of the my favorite books that I read on hermeneutics, which is The Art and the Science of Biblical Interpretation, is Knowing Scripture by R.C. Sproul. That was a wonderful book. And one of the guidelines that you can use to somehow bring peace to those times where you're like, I don't really understand what this passage means, is that everything that is clear, everything that is everything that is explicit in Scripture has precedence over things that are implicit in Scripture. So if, for example, you find a passage that says, Jesus knows all things and knowing the heart of men, like in the book of John, right? He says, and because he knew what was in the mind of men, he didn't need anybody to give him testimony of men. But then when Jesus says, only the Father knows this, the Son of Man doesn't know it, you're going to read this subject and it apparently contradicts itself, but it's not. One of the things that's clear in Scripture is Jesus' deity. So as long as you know that Jesus definitely knew all things and that Jesus has that attribute of God himself because he is God manifested in human flesh through the incarnation, then you can submit that to any passage that you read that implies or apparently implies that Jesus doesn't know all things. So you are going to run into those different passages. As long as you have that guideline and you utilize it and you say, you know what, if ever I run into something, write it down. That part of the Bible that you didn't understand and pray about it. And eventually, as you continue to read scripture, you're probably going to run into another scripture that's going to clear that up. And it's always good to also have in a Christ-like manner, camaraderie, friendship, fellowship with other believers that are also simultaneously reading the Bible. And it's really good to have friends that are sometimes even reading that same particular book that you're in. Then you can sharpen each other and, and ask questions, you know, and seek the answer together. How do we know when we are reading the Bible and jumping into Scripture that we are learning the right way and interpreting correctly? Because so often we hear of people misinterpreting Scripture, maybe even thinking, well, this is what I feel about this Scripture, when it's not always exactly in line with what the correct interpretation is. That's a very good question. And I think that it's something that you develop through discipline. It's not something that's going to happen instantaneously. As you begin to read the Word of God, I promise you one thing, you're going to wrestle. You're going to wrestle with a lot of things that you read in Scripture. A lot of the things that you read in Scripture, here's the interesting part, are not necessarily going to agree with what you hear from the pulpit sometimes. There's a lot of churches that have amazing pastors who love the Word of God. They respect the Word of God. But then unfortunately, you also have churches where the individual that's preaching and that's teaching in the church doesn't necessarily subject himself to the Word of God, doesn't submit to the Word of God, but rather he submits to his own private interpretation. I think one of the things that we have to be very careful with is basing our interpretation on our emotion, on our feeling, or basing it on a sensation that we had. Like suddenly I had this one sensation and this must be true. No. Our own life experience. Our own life experience, which is subjective. And we have to be very careful with that. We always have to interpret Scripture with Scripture. That's another important rule in hermeneutics. And as a student of the Bible, as a disciple of Jesus, is that the Word of God is its own interpreter. As you continue to read the Word of God, that's what I said, write down things that you don't necessarily understand. I guarantee you one thing, once you're done reading through the Bible, and this is a, a beautiful adventure, you're going to read through the Bible. You're going to start loving the Word of God. You're going to say, man, it's true, I don't understand it, but something just keeps calling me to it, calling me to it. It's the Lord himself calling you to fellowship with him through his word. God wants you to know David. God wants you to fellowship with Abraham. God wants you to fellowship with Samuel. God even wants you to know the downfall and the pitfalls of Samson. And he wants you to see how he redeemed Samson. So then later on, you can relate it to your own life. And the more you start delving into the Bible, the more these characters become your brothers and your sisters. You begin to identify with the people of God of the Old Testament. And you realize, man, I might be Mexican, I might be Korean, I might be Japanese, I might be black, I might be white. 
Or both. Or both, black and white. But you begin to realize one thing. Now I'm part of a bigger family. And it's beautiful because as you begin this journey and you begin to identify with them, this is not a figment of your imagination anymore. This is not just you like when you read a Harry Potter book and you get so much into the character or the Lord of the Rings that you begin kind of to identify with those characters. This is a lot more than that because this is the living word of God. And this comes with an amazing reward of transformation. It comes with an amazing reward of sanctification. The more you read it, the more it begins to sanctify you. The more it begins to rebuke you, the more it begins to correct you. And it's beautiful because you start seeing these things and suddenly you're confronted by a Christ-like character that you find in the Bible and that says, if you are a disciple, this is how you live. And it's so beautiful when you experience that with the Word of God. Even if it's in contrast to what a pastor might be saying at a church you grew up in, at a church that you're visiting or somewhere that you've been going to, now because you're reading scripture, you now realize, you know what, I don't think they're as biblically rooted as I thought, or that this doesn't really sound in line with scripture now that I'm learning more scripture. That's a great, great question, great points, my love, because a lot of people, unfortunately, adhere so much to a certain denomination of you. And I want to make one thing clear here on this podcast is even though we go to a certain church and we love our congregation and we submit to the authority in our church, nonetheless, we don't shun anyone from a different denomination. There is something that we must define, and, and I want to state clearly to the audience and to anyone watching us as well, is that even though we have our views of Scripture, one of the things where we are definitely adamant is on what we call the essentials of the Christian faith. These are things that could define whether or not you are, determine whether or not you are a disciple of Christ or not, whether you believe in the deity of Jesus, whether you believe in the infallibility of the Word of God. It's infallible. The inerrancy of the Word of God, that it's inerrant, the inspiration of the Word of God. These things are very important to, to know and to believe. So as long as you believe these essentials, you are my brother and my sister in Christ. Many other things are secondary. And there's going to be some topics that we're going to touch on here that are going to be considered non-essential and secondary. And yes, I'd love to hear from you as well. And I'd love to even one day maybe sit with somebody and, and have a friendly debate. But the most important thing is to pursue those essentials. And one of the things that's beautiful about the Bible is that those essentials are always clear in Scripture. And I thank God for that because that's what unites us as Christians, those essentials. Sometimes as you begin to read the Bible and you begin to see certain things and you begin to connect the dots, the more you read the Bible, the more the Holy Spirit connects those dots for you. See, that's one of the promises that Jesus said in John 14 through John 15, 16, where he had this intimacy with the disciples at the Last Supper. In the upper room, Jesus tells them, and the Holy Spirit, whom I will send from the Father, he will remind you of all the things that I have taught you. And that's beautiful because that's the job and the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what he will do for all of us who open up the Bible with the desire that Jesus would open up the scriptures to us. And I'm thinking that questioning, am I interpreting this correctly, is something that's important to keep, to help keep you humble, and that it's going to be the Lord and you being diligent in your spiritual practices and listening to what the Holy Spirit is telling you to have that balance of humility with confidence in knowing God's word. One of the passages that comes to mind, and I know we have our segment where we read the scriptures, but I'd really like to read it now because I think it's an important passage. It's in first and second Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where Paul tells Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And I believe that when you know you become equipped with the word of God, there's a purpose for him equipping you. There's a purpose for him correcting you. There's a purpose for him rebuking you because he wants to train you in righteousness. He wants to transform your outward life by first transforming your inward life. He wants to transform the way you think. Now, as you're reading the Word of God and as you're studying the Word of God, you will encounter those moments where you might hear something from the pulpit that now that you're a devout student of the Bible, you're going to be able to identify and you're going to say, wait a minute, hmm, that doesn't seem like it's right biblically. And one of the things that I remember having grown up in the Pentecostal church is I, I love the, the emotional aspect of the Pentecostal church. And I dare to say that a lot of these brothers that I had mentioned were Pentecostal brothers, but they had such a balance for love of the Word of God and experiencing the presence of God and experiencing the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
And that's why I, in, in that particular case, I am not a cessationist, which means that I, someone believes that the Holy Spirit gifts have ended for our age. I do believe that they should be applied in a certain context, though, especially when it comes to certain gifts. Therefore, your intimate moments with God, you know, your, your intimacy with God. But I do think that one of the things I, I appreciate is that they had a, an amazing balance until something happened in a lot of the Pentecostal churches is a lot of brothers begin to come in and, and say they had this new revelation. I got a new message from God. And they were very vehement preachers, meaning they're very loud when they preach. And they even make you cry the way they preach. And sometimes it's not the word of God that's making you cry because a movie can make you cry. A movie can move you. It's the way they're speaking, the, the tone of their voice, the vehemence, you know, the power in the way they speak. And unfortunately, because of this, they brought in a whole bunch of movements that were not biblical. And a lot of brothers who were Pentecostal brothers and sisters trusted these people. And they, there was a lot of manipulation. And unfortunately, a lot of the brothers, because they held to such a high degree of respect for the pastor that they wouldn't object to these things, even though they knew biblically, these things were not biblical and they're not right. And a lot of people like even Benny Hinn and other famous preachers would use phrases like, you don't want to touch the Lord's anointed, meaning don't even question me, because if you question me, then you're questioning God. And whenever a leader in the church gives himself that authority that's on par with apostolic authority, at that point, you can't question them because they're on par with the scripture. And that's extremely dangerous. And I definitely want to share this passage with you guys that helped me when I was leaving that sensationalism. I once was, was enslaved to that sensationalism. I had to step out of it and it was really difficult. But the more I started to get into the word of God, the more questions I had about what I was being taught, especially because I began to use the Bible like a ruler. This is how I'm going to measure truth. I'm going to use the scripture as my ruler to measure whether this is biblical or not. Is this from God or not? You see, one of the things that they taught me in the church, and they teach a lot of people in many churches, where they overemphasize feelings and emotions rather than scriptural knowledge. So they would use phrases and take them out of context. And a lot of people thought, well, if he's vehement, it's true. If he made me cry, it's true. No, if it's in the word of God, it's true. Amen. And I definitely want to share this with you guys because this is a passage where God helped me to develop the courage to be able to say, no, unless you can prove it to me in the word of God, I can't adhere to it, especially if you're claiming this is from God. And this is a passage that I love because this has to do, in my opinion, with probably one of the greatest theologians of Christendom, of Christian history, Christian church, and that's the Apostle Paul. Having studied at the feet of Gamaliel, remember what Paul said, even though I studied, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a persecutor of the church. And Paul even says, is in, in Philippians, right? Where he says, yet I count all these things as dung for the sake of knowing Christ. And if you remember when Paul studied, even though he had studied at the feet of Gamaliel, that was his teacher in, in the book of Acts, one of the most renowned teachers of, of Israel. When he converted to Christ, Paul says that he didn't even go to see the apostles. He didn't go to see anybody else right away. He went to dwell in the desert for three years. In Arabia, I think he says, in Galatians chapter 1. He says, and there he received his gospel directly from Jesus. He was directly discipled by Jesus. And Jesus opened the scriptures to Paul, not Gamaliel, not the high priest, not the Pharisees, not the Sanhedrin. Jesus opened the scriptures to Paul. For three years, Paul was learning the scriptures from Jesus, even though Paul was probably a very vehement preacher, performed miracles, demonstrated that Jesus was the Christ. He had a powerful way of doing this, a very persuasive way of doing this. But I want you to read what happens with Paul in this passage. Acts chapter 17, 1 through 11. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of, of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the, the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. 
and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, and when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now listen to what it says here. Now these Jews of Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. But listen to what it says here. Examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. I guarantee you that when they heard Paul preach, they heard the Holy Spirit speak to them. When Paul uttered the words, Jesus is the Messiah, and he showed them with the Old Testament, he is the Christ. Look here in the role of Isaiah. I guarantee you they felt God's presence. It was powerful. And he could easily use that as his foundation to say, you know what? You must believe that Jesus is the Messiah because you feel it in your heart right now. He could have said, look at the sign that I just did. I just healed this man in the name of the Lord Jesus. But instead, listen to what Luke says about these men. Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. He says, these Jews were more noble. What made them more noble? Because they examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. What that means is that when Paul said these things about Jesus, like, wait a minute, Paul. Man, our heart is burning. We feel God's presence. But before we say amen, we're going to examine it. And we're going to examine what you're saying by the word of God. Because they thought, ultimately, the ultimate authority of the church and of truth is the Bible, not man. Not even Paul. And that's powerful. That reminds me of Romans 12, 2 about being transformed or renewed in their, our thinking and our mind and how that leads to discernment, to know what is the will of God and, and to have discernment. That's so important. I think one of the ways that you were able to know when a pastor was saying something that was in line with scripture or not in line with scripture, as persuasive as they might've been, was because you were reading the word regularly over and over and over. Amen. Your mind was being renewed and you were gaining discernment. We're going to need discernment in order to discern whether something is of God or not of God. And as you've mentioned before, that even the devil utilized the word to try to tempt Jesus. So we know that people can skew God's word. Good it can point. be very alluring. It can be very tempting. It can be very persuasive. And that reminds me of 1 John 4, 1 of, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Well, how do you do that if you don't know the word of God to Absolutely. know whether something's not of God? It can be very, very similar. We know that the devil takes true things and replicates it and taints it with his evilness, but it kind of looks like truth. The word of God is powerful. And the more you read it, there's two things here that I'd like to share, and, and it's two scriptures. Jesus, um, when he had been preaching the word of God in John chapter 7, John chapter 8, you know, it says that many Jews believed in him at that moment. And that's beautiful because in appearance and superficially, when you see more people coming to church, when you see more people following Jesus, everybody rejoices. This is a difficult thing to say, but it is true. Sometimes not everyone that is in the church is following Jesus. And not everybody that is following Jesus is always inside the church all the time. I think that anyone who becomes a disciple of Jesus, even if they're not currently consistently gathering in a church or meeting in a church, the more they fellowship with Jesus, the more they will automatically naturally develop a desire and an inclination to want to fellowship with Jesus' disciples, other disciples, and that will lead them to church. And I think there's people who are, for example, on the journey of reading the Bible that aren't at church yet. And that's why the show we have here, the podcast, we want to reach everyone. We want to reach people who are in the church and people who maybe haven't necessarily quite made the decision yet. I would love for them to open the scriptures and Jesus will speak to them. And eventually everyone who reads the Bible will want to fellowship with other believers who also read and study the Bible. And there's two passages here that I believe shed a lot of light into what we're talking about here. And this is what it says. In John chapter 8, to those believers who had already believed in Jesus, this is what Jesus says. So Jesus said, and this is John chapter 8, 31 and 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And this next verse is probably the most, they say mentioned verse of the Bible that's taken out of context in movies and books and a whole bunch of other places. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. 
Listen to what he says. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's threefold. So first is to be set free and to really know truth. You have to be a disciple of Jesus. And maybe you can define abide because that might not be a word that someone yes, who doesn't correct. read scripture might not know. Good, good. Thank you for that. It's to dwell, to live in his word. To know truth, you must be a disciple. You, when, you, when you become a disciple of Jesus, you will know truth. But then he says this, one of the conditions of being the disciple or a natural result of abiding in God's word, of living in God's word, of studying God's word, it will make you a disciple of Jesus. You cannot be a fully committed disciple of Jesus without the word of God. It's almost impossible. And a lot of times when Christians try to live that way, they're hanging by a thread of emotions because their emotions will only hold them there for so long until they're tested, until waves come and beat on that house. But if that house is built upon sand, it's going to sink, it's going to fall. But when that house is built on the rock, it will withstand. And that rock is the word of God. And it leads me to this other passage that I believe, you know the truth. And Jesus says the truth will set you free, right? And one of the ways that you stay in the truth and you can discern falsehood, there's a promise here that Jesus says, if you constantly stay in his word, you're going to know that truth and you won't be easily deceived because that truth will bring in you a spirit of humility, not of a know-it-all, but of humility and say, you know what, Lord, I am confused by this subject. So it, the work of the word of God in our lives is twofold. It's to keep us in Jesus' truth. And remember, Jesus is the embodiment of truth. Jesus ultimately says it's synonymous. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is truth. He is the embodiment of truth. So when you know truth, you know Jesus. And when you know Jesus, you know truth. And that word of God is twofold. Not only does it protect you from deception, it protects you from being misled and from being deceived with false doctrines. Here's the other benefit of it. And a lot of times where we think of the word of God as a sword, a lot of people mainly probably remember the passage in Ephesians 6 because it's an offensive one, cool one, but also it's twofold. It also is an amazing tool for introspection. Listen to what Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit and of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is the description in the book of Hebrews of a high priest pretty much separating an animal and cutting it and getting that animal ready for sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So what does the author of Hebrews say here? He says, that's how the word of God is in your life. The more you read it, the more it's going to protect you from your worst enemy, which is your own flesh, your own self, your own pride. Once it's living in our heart, more than just discerning falsehood that's coming from without, we will also discern falsehood that comes from within. It's really powerful. And you've also mentioned before that even though you may be wrestling inside, what a blessing it is to be mm, wrestling about the, word of, about the word of God instead of the things of the world. I remember myself also wrestling with certain passages of the Bible and not being able to rest. My mind was troubled by the Word of God, by trying to discern a certain subject in the Word of God, right, and, and to understand it. And I remember, though, thinking, what a blessing it is, man, to wrestle with this versus my mind thinking about maybe where I'm going to work tomorrow or what I'm going to do or, you know, how I'm going to spend that money. Or if I can't get this person, you know, to agree to what I say, how am I going to handle it? How am I going to handle rejection. Well, here's a passage. It's an interesting passage where one of the apostles is talking about another apostle. And this is in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 17. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. And this is what Peter's saying. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Listen to how Peter is referring to Paul's writings. He said, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, but who's twisting them? Not disciples. The ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. But listen to this, as they do the other scripture. Sometimes when people twist scripture, 
they twist a lot of other scriptures as well. There's that consistency of twisting scripture. And that's one thing where more than guarding your heart from outward falsehood is your heart from accepting that falsehood and embracing it. And eventually, guess what? You yourself spreading it and teaching it. I think the reminder would be, and leading into the next question, would be, do we ever stop reading scripture or should we be reading scripture continually over and over, over and over? I haven't stopped in almost 30 years. And to be honest with you guys, even if I read it a dozen times, a hundred times, I always hear God speaking to me through it. And it's amazing how I always learn something new. And I want to share this passage with you guys here. This is Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. That's resurrecting the soul. It brings life to your soul. That's dead. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent of from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. And I love this last verse. And it's my daily prayer. I pray this every single morning. Let the words, and I sometimes sing it at home, right? I sometimes sing it. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's a beautiful, beautiful verse. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, not just what I say, but even my thought life, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Those are amazing scriptures. I think those are some of the scriptures you brought for our scripture section today. So maybe we could just reiterate which those were. Absolutely. Did you have any other ones that you wanted to review? Yes, actually. And, and maybe I'll end with this one. And this is actually uh, the scripture where I, I read the phrase opening the scriptures. And this is the story of the two men that were on the road to Emmaus. And this is how it reads. It says in Luke 24 verses 13 through 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now that very day was Resurrection Sunday. This was the day the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. These two brothers, one of them is named, the other one isn't, were leaving Jerusalem and they were on the road to Emmaus. It says, it was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, when they did not find his body, they came back saying that he had see, that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Listen to what they're saying. They're doubting the women, pretty much. They're saying, we hear these women saying these things, but who knows, you know. And some of the men went, some of like Peter and John went, but then they didn't see him. So the women are saying he resurrected, but we're, we're skipping town. We're leaving because, you know, we don't want to undergo this persecution or we don't want to be here. We're going back home. Here's the deal. This is what Jesus tells them. And this is how we know they were thinking while they were saying these things, because this is how Jesus responds to them. Oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
That's an exclamation there, right? So maybe it should be, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, listen to this, and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning him. He's starting to open the scriptures to them. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? while he opened to us the scriptures. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what, what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And now if we fast forward to Luke 24, verses 44 through 47, now they're back with the other apostles, the other disciples, and Jesus appears again. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me, listen to what Jesus is going to say here, in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then, and this is the meaning of opening the scriptures, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. I love this passage because even though these two disciples were already on their way out, our Lord is so loving and he knows our hearts. He knows that they loved him, but they were full of doubt and they were leaving Jerusalem. They were leaving the scene. And it's beautiful because he doesn't just appear to the apostles that are still in Jerusalem. He appears to these two disciples that weren't apostles. They were amongst the 500 disciples that he had. It's beautiful how he pursues us. And he knows that when you really want to learn scripture, he will reveal himself to you. That's how our Lord is. That's who Jesus is. And then what does he begin to do? He begins to teach them. He does rebuke them. So be prepared for some rebukes here and there. So he, the Lord will rebuke you. He'll call you out. He has good boundaries. He won't look the other way at your sin. But he's also going to call you into fellowship with him. And the reason he calls you out and he rebukes you, because he wants us to partake of that holiness. And here he begins to partake and to give that to these disciples. And what does it say? Our hearts were burning as he opened the scriptures to us. Our hearts were being transformed. They immediately had to walk back. He didn't teleport them, but they had to walk back the seven miles back to Jerusalem. And the amazing thing is when they're there, then he confirms it and he reveals himself to all of them now. And he once again says that he opens the scriptures to them and he begins to show them from Moses, that's referring to the Old Testament, to the Torah, to the prophets, which are all the prophets in the, in the Old Testament, and then the poetic books, the Psalms. And see, that's the beauty of Scripture, that you will find Jesus in all Scripture. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about the Lord Jesus, and you will find him there. And how often do we have that burning in our heart after the Lord has called us and sought us out? That's an important message for us to heed, that burning in our heart. He will honor that desire to learn more about him. When you feel that burning in your heart, when you hear God calling, you need to answer. Amen. A couple of scriptures that I brought include the first one, which is Psalm 1, 1 through 3, which is, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day mm. and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. So this man is blessed because he delights in the law of the Lord. He meditates on it day and night. He yields fruit, and its leaves do not wither, despite mm. the circumstance. I think it's really important to remember about reading scripture. Amen. Amen. The second scripture and last scripture that I brought today was 2 Timothy 2.15, which is, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. How do you rightly handle the word, word of truth? You need to know what the word of truth says. Amen. So jump into scripture. Amen. Now, what would you have everyone to have as their takeaway out of everything that we said, one thing that you'd have them walk away with? 
remember that it's not a great preacher, a televangelist, and it's not even a great school that opens the scriptures to you. It's Jesus Christ, and he's there for you. And if you really want to know scripture, cry out to him if you have to cry out. Pray sincerely and ask him to open the scriptures to you. I guarantee you he will not deny you. He will open the scriptures to you, and you will find Christ all throughout the scripture. Amen. Well, we're so glad that you were on here today. We will see you back very soon because you're a co-host and a frequent mm -hmm. guest. And thank you to all of you who are watching this video podcast or who are listening to our audio podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard today, if you got benefit out of it, we encourage you to give us a like, to subscribe, to follow us so that way you don't miss anything. And it helps encourage us to keep on going. And don't forget that we're on Facebook and Instagram and again on YouTube because we're going to post certain things on there that you might not get on our audio podcast platform because there's not an, an avenue to be able to do that. You might find snippets. You might find out special information about our guests and lots of different things. So go ahead and check that out and go ahead and give us a like and follow. Close us out in prayer. Absolutely. I would love to. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of our precious Lord Jesus. Father, we ask that you would please um, open up our hearts and our minds to your word. We pray, Father, that you would open your word to us, Lord. We need you desperately. Lord, we are hungry for your word. We are thirsty for your word. And there is an area in our heart, in the deepest part of our soul, that only you can satisfy, that only you can fill. And that is that honey that we eat, that is sweeter than honey. And that is your holy word, Lord. As our Lord Jesus taught us and said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This is your word that we now have even on our cell phones, in our pockets. We can carry it with us wherever we go, Lord. We have no excuse to not delve into your word. I pray for all those who are believers that you would move them, that you would motivate them, Lord, and some that you would exhort and rebuke to get into your word daily, Lord. We need your word because if we're not into your word, we're into the world. And I pray, Father, that all those who hear us who have not yet committed to you, but have questions, have doubts, and recognize that there is an emptiness in their soul, in their heart, and they've been trying to fill that emptiness with other things that can never satisfy them, please manifest yourself to them. Please hear their prayer and incline your ear to them in your mercy, in your compassion. Lord, manifest yourself to them, that even if they don't go to church but they hear this podcast, that they would hear your voice, Lord, through your word that we read today. I pray, Father, that you would stir us up, that we would encourage one another, that we would be able to ask each other, where are you in regards to your holy word? and that we would share with each other to edify each other. Lord, I pray that just like we binge on shows and just like we dedicate so much time to like sports and all these other things that we engage in that are not bad things, they are good things, but they are things that though they are good, cannot give us the joy that only your word can give us. I pray that you help us, Lord, and that you guide us to a more sincere, to a more devout discipleship, that we would love you with all of our heart and that we would abide in your word, that we would live in your word and truly be your disciples and truly being your disciples, that we would know the truth and that truth, you are that truth who sets us free. Thank you so much, Lord, for your love and your mercy. I pray that you bless everyone who listens to this podcast, that you would fill their hearts with peace, with love and joy, the fruit of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. amen. All right, everybody, we will see you next time. Ciao. Amen.